Welcome to the Rooted Healing Podcast, where we seek to deepen our kinship with the living world and with the great mystery that runs through us. This is a space where stories heal with words that weave us closer to our wild and daring natures, bringing together the expansive minds, topics, and ideas that help us heal, reimagine, and co-create the world we wish to thrive in. The kinds of ancestral energies that are really required for the level of healing that we're talking about, we need to go back maybe in the range of thousands of years old, that we're living at a time that they still had an intact proper relationship with the other beings in the land and the waters that still had intact cultural traditions. And when we're talking about thousands and thousands of years ago, I mean, there's not going to be, there's no written record, there's not a map. And so we have to find another way to go about that. And that might come through dreams, that might come through plants, that might come through learning a few words or prayer in one of the many, many languages, or original languages of our peoples. It might be a pilgrimage to those lands and waters, if that's something that's available. It might be through the art, you know, it might be through the patterns woven into rugs. It's not lost. It's all around us. And so working with those elder powers that are full strength, that are not in a state of wounding themselves, those are ones that can be relied upon, that can be trusted, that we can listen to. And it's a collaboration with those ones to do whatever kind of healing is needed for the rest of them that are downstream and then ultimately for ourselves and you know for the children that come after us kira swanerton ms is an edge walker healing artist and scientist kira teaches nature reverence ritual and restoration ecology bridging the worlds of science and the sacred merging rigor and ethics with herbal wisdom and ancestral traditions and her dharma includes delittering and planting seeds, uplifting vulnerable creatures, and revitalizing wild places. Kira specializes in land and water tending, depossession and curse unraveling, plant medicine and psychedelics, dream work and ceremony, and regularly speaks, teaches, and writes about biocultural conservation of entheogenic plants and fungi with a focus on peyote and Sonoran desert toad habitat protection. Kira upholds the traditions of her British, Irish, Armenian and Italian ancestors and is an initiate in Vedic and Norse spiritual lineages. Kira serves as the custodian of two salmon-bearing creeks in the mountains of Mendocino, California and frequently travels to the San Francisco Bay area. You can connect with Kira at rootwisdom.com or at the Atehana Nature Preserve. This was a potent conversation to have, especially in the lead up to our ancestral gathering next month, where we're meeting within ancient mythical Celtic rainforest in Arwydfa, North Wales, to explore what it means to re-indigenize ourselves with the land. Like Robin Wall Kimmerer's quote, to be native to a place, we must learn to speak its language. We are embodying our early ancestors' wisdom and ways to access their guidance and love. And this talk of re-indigenizing, this is about relationship with the land, not ownership of it. I know that many words in our language are weighted, and these words have been used in very harmful ways in the past. And so this notion of re-indigenizing, it's really about becoming native to place Whatever your ancestral lineage is, wherever you're from, some people are coming to this gathering from very far away to connect with their early ancestral lineage and the land that shaped their ancestors. And then some of us are coming locally as a sort of home calling, bringing deep insight to our current relationship with the land. And then other people are coming with no ancestral tie to the land, but they want to explore deeply ancestral way of just being together making things and from where we stand upon this earth digging deep and becoming native to place through our deepened sense of ecology spirituality and psychosocial spiritual togetherness and the real intention for this gathering is to acknowledge that we're in an age of crisis and disconnect 
and to be together in a way that helps us remember what has been dismembered so that we can revision how to live in true reciprocity and reclaim our creativity, our sovereign creativity. Because this is where the deep innovation happens. And this is where we as individuals, but also as community, as a collective, can bring healing to our inner and outer landscapes, move away from this individualistic culture. We're meeting at the most beautiful liminal threshold of Kai Mabon, which is an award-winning eco-community centre with a Celtic roundhouse and all these cob buildings and wooden little dwellings and the rushing river and mountain lakes and I've probably mentioned it three times already, the Celtic rainforest. I mean, there's just moss everywhere and such a diverse ecosystem. And so this is the grounds that's holding this work. And we'll be making drums with Dory Joy, who's been on the podcast way earlier on, and also rattles with her and medicine bags, maybe even medicine shields. And and we have Nareda showing us natural spinning and dyeing with the plants. Ben's taking us on a folkloric foraging quest into the woods and beyond to enjoy in our feast from the hearth that Lawrence and Lou are putting together, really celebrating ancestral nutrient-dense foods with fermented drinks every day like elderflower wine and and I think hawthorn beer. We've got Lawrence coming onto the podcast, that'll be the next episode that's coming out, talking about bringing new reverence to the hearth. How do we revive the the sacredness for lack of a better word of of the hearth of cultivating nourishment and togetherness oh and we also have eric madden doing storytelling and folk singing around the fire as well so there's just it's just the most nourishing time and i'm telling you more about it because we still have two spaces left and we'd love to offer a 10 percent discount to our listeners so yeah this gathering really is a time for profound connection obviously total digital unplugging, deep, deep listening and a radical presence with our indigenous souls and the spirits of the land. So you can head to rootedhealing.org slash ancestral to learn more and get your discount. Kira mentions two incredible projects in this episode that I am in awe of and hope to bring onto the podcast and integrate into our mission at Rooted Healing. They are Indigenous Medicine Conservation Fund and Grow Medicine. For anyone who has partaken in Indigenous healing traditions, I strongly encourage you to go and check these projects out, as I'm sure they will resonate with you as much as it does with me, and hopefully we can amplify this work together. To accompany this episode, Kira and I recorded an additional part for our Patreon community. You'll hear Kira speak of a potent guiding dream that came through during her time at Standing Rock. And in this Patreon exclusive dialogue, Kira expands on this dream and we discuss the tender topic of tending to our own family-born wounds in order to become better activists of eco-socio-spiritual work. We also still have a free one-on-one consultation with Elisa Fusi from our last episode, which is such a special gift where you can explore a healing path through or from chronic disease, such as cancer or autoimmune conditions. And by the way, she's offering that to whoever wants it from our Patreon community. So it's not actually just one consultation that we're giving away. And we'll be announcing the winner very soon for our most recent giveaway, which was Rob Hopkins' latest book, From What Is to What If, who was also on the show recently. Our Patreon archive is rich with content, and we'd love to invite you to join us and deepen your healing journey. With a pay-what-you-can model, you can gain immediate access to workshops, meditations, additional resources, and all of this exclusive content, including transcripts from episodes from as little as £2 a month which is like sharing your hot chocolate with me. (laughs) Okay, back to the episode. Enjoy. You've written that many of us are lost, disconnected, and hungry for a sense of belonging after generations of displacement, oppression, colonialism, and the rippling ongoing consequences of cultural wounding. Can you share your ancestral story 
and how you found yourself recognizing this yearning? Well, I'll say that um, I live now in California and was born here. And a number of generations of my family have been born here in these lands. And um, the history of California is an interesting one and still unveiling itself to me. But the story of my own people coming here as settlers, as colonizers, as refugees from many, many places uh, across um, Europe and Western Asia requires some looking back. It requires some turning around and unpacking how this came to be. How, how did I come to be born here? How did I come to sleep here, eat, drink the waters here, dream here, eat the foods here, have access to land and resources here? And it's a bloody story. Um, it's a beautiful story. And we've all got a story like this. My own people most recently came from parts of Northern Italy, Southern Italy and what's now Sicily, um, the Armenian highlands and around from around the Mediterranean, also parts of the British Isles and Ireland and all throughout parts of Western and Southern Europe. And, um, you know, as, as an American living here, um, it's a, it's very common for people have, to have lost their family stories. People move around, um, there's not this like, rooted sense of having like, oh, I understand your accent or I recognize your last name and that must mean that you're from this region or that region. Um, it's like a wiping away or erasure of those past identities, um, which does harm you know, to ourselves, but it also erases the story of how we came to be and have the things we have and live in the places that we have now, which is, um, is something that we need to look at and we need to learn about. And it is such a painful and terrifying prospect that I see how this plays out in, um, in kind of this um, resurgence of the demon of uh, white supremacy, like coming to the fore in this um, uh, with a certain like freshness and vigor right now. And there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of kind of like rattling of the bones, I would say that I'm experiencing now and that I see happening, you know, around the world. And so, you know, there, there's a way that that can um, be a wake up call and that we can tend to that and say, oh, there's unfinished business. There's, there are, there are ghosts, there are stories, there are mm -hmm. reparations, there, there are, um, there's healing to do. Um, and then there's a, you know, a terrified response to that, which is like kind of pushing back, um, circling the wagons, you know, actually circling the wagons and, and, and fighting the other. So, so my own story has to do with um, what it took for me to find the safety resources, strength teachers to allow me to turn around and look. Um, and that is an ongoing process and is something that I've been truly lucky to have an opportunity to do. It also has to do with the, the, the resources that are available to me, the safety, um, the financial well-being, all the rest of it. Like, you know, I'm in a position in my own life, I'm 47, I don't have children. Um, and I've got a lot of education and opportunities. And so there's a um, there's an opportunity for me to do some of this like spirit level heavy lifting in my lifetime because I have the bandwidth and the resources to do it. So there's it's kind of like in this moment of of, of safety in this lifetime of safety that I've experienced. Um, there's there there's room there's a chance to take a breath and and do some unwinding 
of, of the, the terrifying and the terrible parts of that history and also some reclaiming because, um, you know, it's not all, um, it's not all trouble. You know, there's so much beauty. Um, there's so much strength. There's so, there's so much that's available to us. And um, when I talk about that yearning and that hunger, I often see that, and I've, you know, this has been the story for me as well, but what I often see is um, people that don't have, that were not raised in any kind of intact tradition, when we see that outside of ourselves, um, when we see that in Indigenous communities that exist or coexist with us, um, it's, there's this, um, the hunger comes up, you know, the hunger for eating mm -hmm. other people's medicines and appropriating other people's ceremonies. Um, the need is real. Like the need is real and the hunger is real, but the food is wrong. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a way to truly be nourished and to, um, and to nourish the dead, our own dead with the right food and the, and the practices and the prayers and the languages and the medicines um, that are that are known and familiar to ourselves and to the people that we are from, and we can do that in such a way that continues to honor um, those relationships and informs us about how to be better guests, better newcomers to the lands where we live. And that may not be the story for all of your listeners, depending on where they're from and what their family history is, but. You know, where I live in the Americas, it's very much the story for many people. Yeah, there's so many things you wove in there. And something that stood out for me is this rekindling or reclaiming of our ancestral medicines. And I know you've shared a lot about this. And especially during the reemergence of you know, psychedelic renaissance, what are the most sustainable and rooted plants people can work with? Yeah. Well, that's going to vary, right? Yeah. <laughs> Depending on who you are and, and where you live. But I think that there are, there are some big plants out there. There are some big ones. There's some big teachers that can teach us how to listen to some of the more subtle teachers. So, um, mm. You know, there are, there are plants that have spread throughout the world that we've been interacting with all over the place. Like if you look at the story of tobacco and how quickly, how quickly that plant moved out of the Americas, you know, out of the new world and just across the globe. Um, I think that, you know, cannabis is similar in that way that it's a pretty gentle um, pretty gentle teacher in many ways. Um, and that's available to many people in many places. Um, so there are things that are potent plants, like the ones that I mentioned that, um, are already out and about with purposes of their own <laughs> above and beyond <laughs> what we think that they may be for. Um, but in general, my recommendation would be to start, um, start from the inside and work your way out. Like start with what is already present and, and, and near. So I don't always mean like you need to put it in your body, but you know, what, what plants are, are, are you, are you, are your clothes made from? Is your home made from, you know, um, what are you touching and seeing every day? And so, there's um, there's a way to sort out this like complex sense of belonging, which I think is a collaboration between plants that might be m more ancestrally rooted. Like for me, for example, the first thing that comes to mind is um, you know olives and olive oil. So many of my people come from around the Mediterranean, and that is a plant that has built body after body generation after generation and we don't think of that as like some heavy hitting you know master plant but it is the foundation it, that's a that's a very rooted mm -hmm. plant and in the place where i live now 
um, which is in a part of Northern California. I live in historic Huchnum territory here. The, the plant that's fed the body after body, generation, generation after humans of this land um, are, are oaks and acorns. And the oak, acorn, and the olive have so much in common. They can understand mm. each other. And, you know, if I can go to oak with an understanding in my body, in my spirit of what olive has meant to me and my own people and offer up that and say, hello, you know, I'm from these people. I'm from olive people. Like we greet you. We know you like there's a similarity. There's, there's a, there's a relationship. There's a kinship there and an understanding that is beyond my understanding as a person, but um, it's kind of like a plant to plant link. And there's a way that I can learn to view and understand a deeper level of what Oak perhaps has historically meant and means to the beings that have grown here alongside it. um, If I tap into what Olive has meant for me and my own people. So that's an example of a way Mm, I love that. That's very similar to an aspect of a journey that we guide called Deepen Your Roots. And we help people connect with their local flora and fauna through the folkloric wisdom as well. But the way you just described that, we are olive people and, you know, greeting the oak from that perspective, becoming less human and more ecological self. I I really love the way you just articulated that. Also, the way you spoke about tobacco being so widespread now, this has come up in a previous conversation with Andrea Scaripor. We were reflecting on how it's almost, when it loses that reverent relationship, it carries this other energy, like co- the coca leaf being extracted and turned into cocaine and tobacco being extracted and smoked with all these other chemicals and but the way you just spoke about it sounded like the plant itself might have an agenda like the plant itself might want to yeah who knows (laughs) I just find that really interesting the way you presented that Mm -hmm. you were talking about this hunger that guides many of us towards other ancestral plant medicines and I know you've shared about peyote and raising some awareness around the fact that these aren't sustainable relationships, you know? I don't know if there's anything you want to speak to about that. Oh, so much. <laughs> so much, <laughs> yeah. so much about that. Um, you know, I, I had um, the privilege over, you know, the period, the major period of COVID lockdowns to be part of a project called the Femtheogen, Femtheogen Collaborative, uh, it was kind of the first time that I'd had an opportunity to be on the funder end of things, you know, make making grants and uh, distributing resources. And the the team of folks that I ended up working with decided that, you know, the 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 focus of the grant making that we were going to do um, was around biocultural conservation, and so not just about supporting the plants to continue, but the people and the lands and the traditions to continue um, in ways that were directed by the people and the plants and the lands. So um, we partnered with a number of different organizations. There's a, I just want to put this out there for your listeners who might be interested in incorporating more forms of reciprocity into the medicine work that they're already participating Mm -hmm. in. Um, And there are some mechanisms that are like coming into being. So there's something called the indigenous medicine conservation fund. Um, There's also a a project called grow medicine. Um, And there's some information about this on my website for people who want to know more, but um, the idea being is that, you know, we're receiving so much from these like potent plants and the traditions that hold them and the people, you know, um, and it's Mm -hmm. coming from the land itself, you know, but what is our, are are we insatiable? Are we going to eat up all the medicine? You know, are we going to continue to replicate our own sort of extractive orientation 
with the natural world and see ourselves as outside of that and just like eat it into oblivion. And um, that's already the case. So, you know, uh, with the kind of mainstreaming of psychedelics, psychoactive substances, like, you know, there, there's, there's so much promotion that's going on and not, um, not a lot of like slowing down and listening, you know, um, even though that's what so many of these plants are teaching us to do. We're talking about um, unity and healing, but what about the land? What about, what about the, what about the Sonoran desert? You know, what about the waterways there? What about the Yaki people in their river? You know, no, we want the toads. We want the toad medicine. That's all we want. So we're cherry picking. <laughs> we're 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 still replicating this um this harmful relationship mm-hmm. even in this world of healing and so there there is a need for some consideration there about what can be sustained what is appropriate how often are we getting the most out of what are we doing our homework or are we just going back for more and more and more so, um, so in that way, uh, I think that there is a real opportunity to step up this world of healing and to, for those who have, have enough strength and are ready to begin to focus beyond the individual self and beyond that personal yeah. healing and, and step it up to the next level, then we have to take into account. Um, bigger and bigger and bigger uh, pictures. So we can grow things. Yeah. <laughs> we can find what's near us. We can develop relationships. Um, we can stay out of extractive practices. We can ask about the sources of where the medicine that comes to us is coming from. And we can do a little mm-hmm. bit of research. So I would just name that um, Iboga is on that list. Uh, toads are on that list peyote is on that list Um, some of the component plants to ayahuasca brew are on that list and and others Um, but it's not just about like the plants or the creatures Um, it's about the habitat the forests the rivers the deserts that they come from it's about the people who live in those places and their traditions and their languages you know, there, there's a lot that needs to be conserved. It's the whole, it's the whole package. It's not just the thing that you smoke, yeah. or put it in your body, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. You just said that so well, and it's so needed in this healing paradigm that's still arising from an individualistic culture. And we work with psilocybin and we run occasional psilocybin retreats. And a lot of people through that application process are saying, yeah, I'm choosing between this and an ayahuasca retreat and somewhere else. And, you know, I, I say, well, you know, honor your the calling, but, you know, it takes 20 years to grow an ayahuasca dose. And psilocybin is is our collective ancestral medicine and grows absolutely abundantly. So just to throw that out there. And it's amazing how no one has considered that at all in the decision-making process until they say it. Right. Yeah. I I, I like to say, like, we talk about set and setting. Let's add source. Like, let's think about that. Yeah. Yes. Set, setting, and source. I think that should be its whole own Mm -hmm. (laughs) um, campaign within this industry. Absolutely. And I I hate to call it an industry as well, but it absolutely is now, you know, like with everything, it's becoming so commodified. And I know with the work that we're doing, I, I sit in some really tender questions around how much responsibility do we have to really support people integrate these experiences with psilocybin because that's obviously a really big missing piece for a lot of people who are doing this um but also at what point do we really just need to trust that people the seeds are planted that people are also going to start implementing it into their lives and it's hard going into a disconnected world after these experiences with the plants it is hard oh yeah 
So there are many people and organizations teaching about the principles of ancestral wisdom and reciprocity. But something I love about the multifaceted work that you're doing is how you're also an environmentalist and you're an environmental consultant. Um, I'd love to hear about what it's been like weaving these worlds of spirituality <laughs> and environmentalism, um, which may perhaps offer some encouragement to root our quote unquote animistic renaissance that we're in. Yeah, I mean, that is a, that's a work of my life, <laughs> <laughs> marrying these things. Um, you know, for me, and I find that this is often you know, it's, it's the case for a, a lot of people. I mean, you, you work with what you've got, you, you work with what you have access to, um, to begin with. And for me, that started with the plants that started with working in nature in the natural world and, um, land stewardship, um, restoration ecology. I went and got a degree in that, um, and had this, strong drive to be a healer in that way, like a healing the land and a saving the earth and kind of coming at things from that perspective. You know, for a long time, my business card read um, natural resource manager. And, you know, that terminology is like abhorrent to me now. But at the time, <laughs> I was like, I've made it in my career. Um, <laughs> but, you know, what that what that direction, what that path um, led me to was um, an outside job, like a career that allowed me to be down on my hands and knees in, in the soil and really taking a close look at small things. Um, I've worked a lot with, you know, very s small plants, like eph ephemeral things, uh, things along coastal prairies and, you know, r rare and endangered creatures and the insects that that they support, and 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 just being in this like micro world, um, and doing things like uh, you know, clinging to the edge of a cliff in the fog on the edge of the Pacific Ocean as the, the you know the land crumbles into the sea, try to count however many are left of such and such plant, you know, here and there, and um, what I didn't recognize at the time that was happening to me, um, and I didn't have the words for it. I don't even know if some of the words existed, but you know, I was just really leaning into this uh, process of rewilding, and that I don't think that word even was around then. Um, but I felt like a feral creature. You know, um, I was working in San Francisco, a large city, and peeing outside every day because that was where I was working. And so like my body was already becoming part of the place. You know, I had seeds in my hair. I was growing plants. I was collecting seeds and growing native plants and putting them in the ground. And, you know, uh, you know, I thought that I was th the healer, you know, I thought that I was the steward and I was the one that was doing the work, but I was getting trained, you know, I was learning to have these mm -hmm. relationships and listen to plants. And, and for a long time, my, my, spiritual um like perceptive abilities were being trained trained up but I didn't really know it at the time I still was like oh you know I'm the science one and I've got these friends that are the woo woo ones but that's not really <laughs> me you know I'm this grounded person and you know I don't see or hear or feel all that stuff but you know I was being trained I was being trained and I was learning to listen and um I, you know, I, I finally came to understand that I, I was the one that was being healed. You know, I was mm -hmm. the one that was getting, um, being trained to be of service in a different sort of way. And so I brought that kind of connection and relationship to the natural world, the intimacy, that like deep intimacy and knowledge of all these creatures that are around me. And when I started really diving into the human ancestral piece um, I was a little more ready, perhaps, but I, I thought maybe I could get away <laughs> with it in this lifetime of not like doing the messy human level work. You know, it's kind of you know, sometimes easier just to be like working with the elemental stuff, working with the ocean, 
working with the plant world Mm -hmm. and and not doing the human level work. And so I was, um, there were just so many roadblocks to me continuing in that career. I wasn't able to like succeed in the way that I wanted to. I was feeling very frustrated, not really being able to speak about the entirety of what I do in, you know, writing some government report about like how our um, rare butterfly reintroduction program is working. And these are all the metrics that we're looking at. And nowhere in there was a place where I could include that I sing to them, you know, mm-hmm. and that we we're bringing them back to these lands that they have previously lived in, that I'm letting them know where they are and telling them that they're home and like dropping in in that kind of way. And so, um, that became a a real point of pain for me um, to feel like that um, my interior experience, the reality of the way that I actually worked was not, there was not a place for it and that language or that career. And eventually I had to leave, you know, working for government institutions and big nonprofits and these, you know, um, um, these entities that were the, the holders of a lot of, of wild land and um, take a risk and, and quit <laughs> and start mm-hmm. to work for myself and, 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 f- and find another way and find other guidance and find other teachers. And that included having to go and do this ancestral piece. So, so the last day that I was working, um, uh, working for local government, uh, doing that plant-based work um, was around the kind of the, some of the peak, peak time of the protests at Standing Rock which Mm -hmm. I I don't think I need to explain what that is to your listeners, hopefully. Um, And I remember showing up, uh, showing up there, kind of not knowing why, Um, kind of yes, but kind of no, like there was just the straw to be in that place. And um, knowing that there was some spirit level work for me to do, but not really knowing what that was or how to do that in an appropriate way. And, you know, mostly just being there to help in any way that was, um, you know, uh, the the simple work of keeping that operation running in small ways. Right. Um, But I, while I was there, I asked for a dream. I was like, what, what do I do here? Like, how can I be of the, you know, highest service in the limited amount of time that I have to participate and be here with all these people? And um, I got a dream. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And it was not an easy lesson. It was a smackdown. It was a serious smackdown from the ancestors of that land who basically tested me. And I failed miserably, miserably. but it was a like a beacon of light, like shining on the point that needed to be worked on, which was dealing with my own ancestors, cleaning up my own house. It's like, if you want to be, uh, if you want to bring your spirit warrior business to the table here, you need to clean up your own business, then we'll talk. So I knew what to do, then I knew what to do. And that has been um, an incredible gift that kind of teaching has been an incredible gift. And I, I still thank those ones that came to me then and um, turned my head in the right direction. And what, what does that lineage repair process entail? Part of the result of, of, of that dream was me seeking out like some way to get at this. I'm like, how does one even approach it? And you know, I was lucky to meet a person named Daniel Four, who had been working on this for a while himself, he was in the process of writing a book, you know, was starting to teach people and train practitioners of this work instead of just sort of carrying it himself, you know, um, and now does quite a lot of work all around the world. And there's many, many people that he has trained and that I have, you know, assisted in training over time. Um, And so I ran across uh, him in the methodology that he developed and 
the the thing that struck me most about that that kind of attracted me to um, to learning some of these skills from him was that the work of healing our own ancestors is not something that can just be done by ourselves, like as, as, as really the children, you know, if you look, uh, if you look at your ancestry or the, you know, various lines of people that we're from, you know, we're on the leading edge of that. We're the ones in the game. We've got the bodies. We can sing, we can make the food. We can feel the pain. We can die. You know, um, we, uh, we have a special, special role um, as living, breathing beings in human bodies in the here and now, and it's temporary. So we got to lean into that job. And the, the true spiritual heavy lifting work is actually done by our own ancestors, like elevated ancestors, elder ancestors. So, so there's a collab, there's a collaboration that's taking place. And what I have learned in, um, experienced both in doing this for myself and with many, many people over the years now is that, you know, it's, it's, it's almost like reconnecting a circuit that requires Mm. the living and requires the dead. It requires a collaboration. And so when we turn back to face what might be a terrifying legacy of harm, of history, um, of all levels of cultural and ecological wounding, it is it is a mountain. It's terrifying. People don't want to. People can't. And in fact, it's not something that we could possibly even do on our own. It has to be something that's done in concert with and under the guidance of our own elder ancestors. So, so the lineage repair process begins with inhabiting our role as the living first and foremost that's mm-hmm. like the being grounded in this world being here doing this and listening and learning to identify um learning to trust um and learning to follow <laughs> Uh, mm-hmm. the guidance of our own elders. And that doesn't really, w- when I'm talking about ancestors in that respect, I'm not talking about like um, a grandparent or even a grand grandparent. Um, sometimes in order to be working with the kinds of ancestral energies that are really required for the level of healing that we're talking about, we need to go back. We need to go mm-hmm. to quite old ones, um, may- maybe in the range of thousands of years old for some of us, depending on the histories of our people. So, you know, mm-hmm. what we're seeking in that regard is, um, you know, actual people who have lived and died, you know, that have given rise to our bodies that are not imaginary, <laughs> that they have existed and walked this earth whose bones are in this earth, you know, um, that we're living at a time that they still had an intact and proper relationship with the other beings in the land and the waters that still had intact cultural traditions. And when we're talking about thousands and thousands of years ago, I mean, there's not going to be, there's no written record. There's not a map. And so we have to find another way to go about that. And that might come through dreams that might come through plants Um, that might come through learning a few words or prayer in one of the many, many languages, like original languages of our peoples. It might be pilgrimage to those lands and waters, if that's something that's available. And so there are ways, um, it might be through the art, you know, it might be through the patterns woven into rugs, Hmm. you know, the, it's, it's not lost. It's all around us but there's I have to get at it in these like sideways and sort of roundabout ways. And so working with those elder powers that are full strength, that are not in a state of wounding themselves, you know, those are ones that can be relied upon, that can be trusted, that we can listen to. And it's a collaboration with those ones to do whatever kind of healing is needed for the rest of them that are downstream. And then ultimately for ourselves and, you know, for the children that come after us. 
Mm, yeah, I was going to ask how far back, you know, generally because, for example, my family history, the, the surname Stanwell is really associated with the tobacco pipe and they were essentially, you know, colonizing tobacco business folk, which is wild. It's wild to learn that. I don't know how to to be in ceremony and to pray with tobacco and how to hold that, how to acknowledge it, how to honor the indigenous folk who have gone through everything to maintain those reverent relationships with the plants. And so to go further back, it's it's beautiful. It reminds me of Lila June. She met her ancient European ancestors in this ceremony. Those are the ancestors I feel like I need to call upon. And something we're trying to embody with our gathering this summer is, is really connecting with the land in Britain and trying to really listen to those early ancestors. We found this beautiful place where there's a a Celtic roundhouse and a proper hearth and it's just one of those places where there's a real liminal threshold when you enter and I'm I'm so intrigued what's going to happen there and with this deep kind of listening so so intrigued mm -hmm. and another thing that comes through is knowing when it's appropriate to really call upon our ancestors I feel like we're in crazy times it's it feels appropriate to call upon them but there's a lot of rituals and there's a lot of, I suppose, kind of Instagram posts saying, you know, sure. name such and such an ancestor and light this candle. And some, some of the stuff I've been around, people are calling upon people and speaking the names into the space. And I've had the thought of, oh, do we, do we want to call them in for this? Is this, is this, this doesn't, I don't know if this feels right. But do you have anything to say to that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. And um, I think that this gets to um, just our inexperience. You know, there's there's a lot of bumbling along the way and getting oneself into trouble, you know. And I've certainly done things the hard way myself and then found some good teachers and gotten to practice and r refine, you know, r refine my own processes. And one thing that I would say about that is, um, A, they're always with us. You know, our blood ancestors are right here in our bodies. They're, they're here at all times. <laughs> mm. um, but the idea about when to, when it's not, I wouldn't say it's so much about like when to, call upon them, but how to be um, more precise in who and what and which ones we're calling. It's so, you know, to have this blanket term of calling all the ancestors, I don't want all of that energy <laughs> right up in my space or within a ritual space. And that is not, um, <laughs> that's not going to be helpful or even healthy at some times. So, you know, when I think about which ones that I might be calling, I, I make sure unless I've really done um, some thorough work, you know, that the, um, the ones that I'm calling are in a state of well-being. So I would be precise in your language, for example, mm -hmm. and the quality of ancestor contract that you're calling for. Um, so that's one thing because, you know, not all our ancestors are in a state of well-being and having some of their that up close to us is not going to be helpful or even useful. Another thing that I would consider about that is, um, you know, it may be different for you if some of the ritual that you're doing is on your own ancestral lands. But for example, for me, as, as a settler on these lands, um, where I live now, um, if I'm calling forward ancestors who have not uh, been sorted out themselves, uh, what kind of uh, encounter am I setting up for my own ancestors and spirit to encounter the ancestors of the land where I live now? Like, has that 
work been done? Have those meetings mm -hmm. happened? Um, it's like, have I asked for permission from those who are already here um, to bring in others in spirit? And um, have I made space for the, uh, those those ancestral elders, both of my own and those in the, are in the land where I live now to 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 meet one another? Have I created opportunity for them to uh, talk to one another? And so that is a real consideration for me um, living where I live or when I'm traveling and visiting other places is is um, having respect for who and what predates me exists mm -hmm. already in a place and asking, you know, hey, I'm yeah. here. This is who I am. This is who I'm from. This is who com this is this is who comes with me. This is who's on my team. This is the history. Um, this is what I'm here for and my intentions. Um, maybe bring a gift from you and your people <laughs> to the people and place that you are. And be polite. Like, be a good guest and know what you're mm -hmm. bringing in. And so, you know, doing that can smooth away so much in ritual practices. And it may, um, and if you never hear no, like if you think you're doing this all the time and it's always yes, 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 love and light all the time, maybe you're not really listening. Maybe that's your own mm. voice. So really listening about when it's appropriate and when it's invited, you may have a neutral response. You may get a, you know, uh, we talk about consent, <laughs> working with the spirit world. It, it goes in, in, in both directions. So um, so that is that is another little piece of protocol that I would throw out as a recommendation. Yeah, yeah, it reminds me of the teachings to ask permission before you, um, you know, pick a plant or uh, a flower or something, and you can kind of integrate that, and you have this little moment to ask permission, but then, like you say, maybe you're always hearing yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, sometimes maybe the plant is saying no and I, I i've often i've tried to integrate that and i would perceive like if there's an insect on the bit that i was about to pick or if there was just this sort of sensation of actually no this there's something about this part of the plant that wants to express itself i i i say hear that as a no but i it's still not like a clear always yes or no I feel like I'm such a, a novice at this art of asking permission mm -hmm. um in in those yeah ecological ways spirit spirit ecological ways uh, that's such a great place to be though like coming with some real humility is wise <laughs> <laughs> and practice and practicing listening and exercising those muscles like you know, it's not always loud for me either, you know, and sometimes I feel, um, you know, more cut off or more connected. And, um, but I think it is that orientation of, of humility and not a false humility, of, of like a true humility of like being a learner, being a child amongst your own ancestors, you know, mm. um, being a child on the earth right now in a uh, relationship with much, much older, <laughs> old and wise things. They're connecting to the old and wise things with, uh, within us. So um, it's not something to be afraid of um, and making mistakes is part of all of it, you know, um, but being receptive, you know, being a servant, giving your gifts. Like I, I, <laughs> I advocate for service, you know, who are you, who's the, who, who are you working for? <laughs> Think about who you're working for. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, another thing that comes to me as you're speaking is how many years ago this would have been such alien language to me I would think like, what how can we really connect with our ancestors and I I know that a lot of listeners are on this wavelength and you know they're following along and it, it's just occurred to me that there'll still be some people who perceive ancestral worship as super primitive and almost kind of born from a place of um 
ignorance, like, oh, they didn't understand of, I just, I can feel that energy in, in the kind of mainstream reductionist paradigm. And yet we see through most of our human existence, ancestral, ancestor worship, and such a vast array across cultures across the world of this. And the more I dive into this work and the more I am entering altered states of consciousness or whatever it is that I'm exploring myself as a human being upon this earth, the more I understand that actually it seems like they really knew something that we've lost. And we've almost kind of entered this sort of age of amnesia. And I don't know if there's anything you wanted to speak to that, you know, this reductionist paradigm and how the the deeper layers of listening and, and the spirit world wants to be there with us. Hmm. Oh, when you're naming this and saying this, I the I feel the grief well up within me and um it's just sad it's very sad it's something um that needs to be grieved uh because uh, it's such a lonely perspective to me um mm. to not have them to not have our own history of of who we are and everywhere we've been, you know, and all of those who have come before us, you know, when I really lean back into that knowledge, it is, it is vast and it is, there's just so much strength. There's so much there. And the alternative is, is, is lonely, is lonely. Um, the alternative is thinking that we need to come up with a technological solution for the climate crisis, mm. for example. Yeah. It's terrifying. It's like that's a recipe for despair. And um, and there's another way we have lived on this planet, modern humans in more or less the same bodies that we have now. For a very long time, we've done all right. You know, we know how we know how to be humans. You know, we know how to be on this earth. We know how to listen. That's built in. That's built in. Children can do it. You know, like we know, we know how. And it hasn't been very long that this, you know, this cloud has been over us, this cloud of forgetting. And I, I'm so glad that you use the term amnesia because um, oftentimes it feels like that for me as well. Like if I'm thinking about um, on a spirit level, you know, like the things, the things that challenge us face to face, are a different caliber of challenges that the one than the ones that are pervasive and kind of seem like they are, have been seeping into <laughs> all all layers of things so that layer of amnesia or now you know with this sort of crisis of trust mm-hmm. you know anything can be fake news or ai generated or who knows who mm-hmm. do you trust what information do you trust Um, So there's this other, these other kind of like larger patterns of the, that seek to disrupt and disconnect us for why I, I don't know, you know, those are not the forces that I am personally qualified to go head to head with and speak with. And I wouldn't recommend, you know, I wouldn't recommend that one do that. You know, there are human beings living on this planet now who are working on that level. Um, I am not one of them. I don't even know if that I aspire to be one of them. Like I, I think in the realm of, you know, spirit healing work, it doesn't necessarily pay to be ambitious. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it's wiser to be invisible. Um, but truly, you know, uh, um, something that is wise is to, be connected, be connected to our own ancestors, be connected to 
the, the, the land and the spirits of the places that we live, all the places that we've been from, and, you know, to be in relationship, to not be out there alone thinking it's just us making all the decisions. Um, and uh, that's, uh, it's not the path I am on. And I see more and more people that are curious about other ways um, the plants are teaching us, they're reaching out, they're helping us to remember, like, there's a lot of help. There's a lot of help available. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that that brought up some emotion in me. This piece on grief, <laughs> dear friend of mine, Nikki Harrison, she was in the first episode I ever did. She she does a lot of work with grief tending and Francis Weller's book, you know, The Wild Edge of Sorrow is so poignant for that. And I think the more we wake up from this amnesia, the the more we are actually also opening the door to that grief. Right. But like you say, with with this deepened connection of spirit, life, ecology, ancestors, hopefully we can actually hold it. That door can open mm -hmm. because we're not alone. Mm -hmm. Ooh, there's this lineage and there's this community there I think that's so nourishing amongst all of the nuance of the pain of the world this is backtracking a little bit but I just thought it'd be really sweet to hear your perspective on I know you've done a lot of conservation work with the bay checker spot butterflies mm -hmm. and you you spoke briefly about how you weren't able to write about singing to them and like introducing them to the land and that reminds me of folkloric beekeeping and this this beautiful oh mythical relationship I don't know if mythical is the right word that we can have with the creatures and the ecology around us so is there any any teachings these butterflies gave you uh, oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah you know um, so to do that work in particular um, so I'll say a little bit about about these creatures so you know um, so the work that I was doing with the Bay Checker Spot Butterflies, the bay that I'm speaking of is San Francisco Bay, which is a very urban area, but there's pockets of wild space all, all around. And uh, I was working on a mountain that's very close to San Francisco International Airport. So if you ever fly in, um, you'll see this uh, mountain sticking up near the airport and on the side of it is a, there's a city of San Francisco, like city of industry, something like that. It's like written on the side of the hill. And, um, and uh, the original name of that mountain has been lost to history, but the, the closest, um, the closest village site of the um, different groups of Ohlone people that are from around that area is called Siplichquin. So I often refer to that mountain by the name of the closest village site because that's the closest that I have to the name of that place. So um, also known as San Bruno Mountain. So I had this job that required me to um, uh, climb that mountain, walk up the side of that mountain on a regular basis a few times a week, and walk transects, count butterflies, look for eggs, look for different sort of life stages of this plant. And I mean, so of, of this, of this, of this butterfly that had learned to utilize a particular plant, not a native plant, actually a European plant, um, a mm -hmm. kind of plantain is, is known as English plantain. It's also known as white man's footsteps. It's a very uh, ubiquitous plant in grasslands all over the place. And I had actually spent many, many years of my life weeding that out of other grasslands and having this <laughs> orientation with this as a, you know, as an invasive species in some places. And so, um, but this butter, this butterfly has adapted to being able to eat that plant in its larval stages and fulfill its life cycle. So it's been able to switch to a different kind of host plant because its original host plant, this native plantain, is, uh, has been lost, largely been lost. And so there's been this sort of like transition from using um, one kind of food source to another. And that's not always the case, but it, um, it co further complicates this idea about 
indigeneity on a plant level, you know, and what does it take to survive and what is our role as stewards and guardians and uh, um, custodians of land. And um, I often had to park in this housing development and walk past this sign that said, Swinnerton Builders with a different spelling of my last name, which is an English surname. And uh, I was like, oh, these are these are relatives of mine and they're building an office building here and have their, you know, have their sign up there. And I had to walk past that every time to see the destruction happening in my name as I climbed this mountain to do other work for other things. And so Mm -hmm. I had the gift and the opportunity to confront that on a regular basis, to have to walk up the side of this mountain to have to pee in the same place all the time so that the coyotes would know me, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, to have places that I would pray, to have long stretches of time alone in nature, unobserved by other people where I could start to open up my voice and find out what songs might come through without judgment or performance or any of the rest of that, but just sort of to to crack open my voice and to begin to pray and to have offering sites and to make relationships with the ones that are from that place and the, the, the human ancestors who have lived and died there, whose bodies have become the waters and the land that's there and to tap into that, the, the elder being of that mountain itself, mm-hmm. you know, and then be working with these really ephemeral creatures that are, you know, living and dying in, in, in one year's time and getting to see a lot about them. And so, you know, th- that was a training experience for me to go up there, you know, as a scientist, but to have all this time to learn and to receive all the rest of it. And I do remember being up there one day with a colleague of mine um, that I was working um, working with to do a lot of this work. And um, he got a call about this grant opportunity and like, oh, they have to spend this money by the end of the fiscal year. What are we going to do? What's the, you know, what are the questions that we want to ask? And, you know, I knew which questions needed to be asked because I had spent time up there, not just, you know, collecting the data, but laying down in the grass and mm-hmm. asking and listening and, you know, so I felt in that way, like that I had this opportunity to be a bridge because I cultivated different kinds of expertise. And so when there's an opportunity to ask particular questions or to put resources toward um, the healing of this place, like I could actually go and ask the place what's needed, mm-hmm. what direction do we move? And that has resulted in a lot of success. And I don't, think of that as something that it's just like, you know, as a scientist, it's like, oh, did you get, you know, did you get authorship on that paper? You know, you know, where's this Mm -hmm. opportunity to put the mountain, you know, on that paper, you know, where, where where's this opportunity to actually name who and what um, is running the show and who and decide who I work for, and to start to Mm -hmm. do some healing work. And so that for me was just this, you know, opportunity over many years to confront my own name to go to a shell mound site on that mountain and make offerings on a regular basis to drink the water out of the creek there. I don't I mean, <laughs> I, I can't believe I did that. Like I, but I was moved to do it. It's like, it's not like it's an urban place. It's just like, I just, you know, I was told, you need to drink this. And so for a year, I drank the water that ran off that mountain and made songs up there and call upon it even still. And so that bond was built. Um, When, when you occupy a place in another way, you inhabit it. When I put my blood in the ground, when I put my feces in the ground, when I put my urine in the ground, when I put my prayers in the ground, when I put my voice on the air, you know, when I nibble the plants that are around there, when I touch the things, when I listen, when I take it in, like my sense of individuality, uh, individual human identities softens up a bit. And I can be a participant and and a part of that place and the creatures that grow Mm -hmm. and live there are an extension of myself and I am an extension of them 
And so in that way, I feel like there's an appropriate opportunity to be a representative in a human body with a human voice and access to the resources that I have, you know, and the platform that I have to actually start to speak, you know, um, and acknowledge those ones. And so it was not lost upon me that as I'm up there and I'm doing this work and relating to those butterflies and relating to this plantain, I was also listening to audiobooks by Robin Wall Kimmerer in The Breeding Sweetgrass, for example, in which she has a whole own sort of story and perspective about of the plantain plant that these these butterflies are eating. Mm. And so it's not lost on me that we're all a continuation of these stories. And so, you know, if there's a way for people, you know, whether you're doing environmental work or you're doing financial work or you're doing childcare work or whatever work is yours to do in this world to bring your gifts to the table and to be a servant to these larger powers for healing and to listen and to sort out, like, h- how do we apply what we have? you know, our position, our gifts, our talents, our ancestors, and what comes, what flows from them, you know, to be, to be true healers in this world. And um, it's teamwork. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, that was beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. It's a nuanced thing to also look in terms of conservation which in itself is an interesting word in in our current ecological climate because there's just such rapid change happening so quickly and i've heard things about do we need to shift our relationship with invasive species and how do we psychologically approach invasive plants you know how does that ripple out into our relationship with immigrants and immigration right i yeah. don't know if you have anything to speak to about that oh I know my it's gosh. a really nuanced topic yeah i mean i think it gets to this this deeper story of belonging and um and there's a lot to it like we don't know best <laughs> we know some mm. you know my perspective over that has 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 changed throughout my career um, my orientation toward that, um, toward these other beings. And, you know, there's not an inherent, you know, like kind of good or bad about these ones, but I also do see that there is a legacy, um, th- there's a responsibility. So um, this the spread of a lot of, you know, plants throughout the world it, it came a lot faster um, then they would have moved around on, on their own, you know, as it, there's a, it, it's um, the spread of certain species is it's directly really a linked to colonialism as part of the legacy of colonialism. Mm-hmm. So I also see it from that perspective. It's not mm-hmm. just a, Oh, you know, well, plants just do their things and it's like this and it's like that. You know, I, I have seen firsthand kind of the, the, the loss of species richness and biodiversity in the places that I live because there are other creatures that are now here that came here quickly and don't have the predators, don't have like the checks and balances that happen when, um, when you've grown up together over a long period of time. And life is going to work it out. Like it's going to get sorted out, not in our lifetime, maybe on these other like scales of time. Um, mm. But it doesn't mean that we can't have a like healing re- relationship and orientation. So, um, so when we talked before about you know what are appropriate plants to use for medicine, well, you know I live in a place now. I, I'm now the um, uh, the custodian of a very very large piece of wildland here in in California where I live called Atihana. It's about like 160 hectares or so of space. It's huge. You know, it's a huge place. Like I couldn't possibly like manage it, you know, (laughs) you Mm. know, that's, 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 uh, it's, it's, it's too big for me to think I could like fool myself into being in charge, you know, but Mm. um, there's plenty of St. John's wort that's here. That's a, that's invasive in this place. Well, perfect. You know, I can make a lot of medicine from that, for example. Mm. And I can learn to look at the place where I live and see the, the, the prairies or the areas along the Creek that are most intact. And, and, and one of the thoughts, you know, from the, the world of ecology here is to, is about preserving this diversity for as long as possible. 
So it's maybe, maybe it's not going to be forever, but it's more options of the ways that life could go. And so the more diversity that's, that's, that's available as the world is changing, as climate is changing, as conditions are changing, you know, the more diversity that we've got, it's, it's the more colors that the mm. nature has to paint with, you know, the more, the more possibilities that are available. So, so I do, you know, I still cut, uh, a scotch broom and French broom out from the creek where I live, you know. Um, but I've also gotten to see some of these plants um, in their home places and been like, oh, oh, that's what you do. That's how you look. That's how you smell. This is this is this is you in your favorite place. And so I don't, mm-hmm. um, you know, I don't blame the creatures, but it's all right to use the sword. Yeah, like it's a it's it's a right to bring an edge. It's a right to have some boundaries, and it's a right to be a, a protector in these ways. But you know, if we think that we're the ones that are making all these decisions, or we know better, then we can get you know twisted up about it. So I don't have a perfect solution or or, or answer to that, but um, uh, but I have um, I have ways of listening. I have ways to guide me and to guide my hand. And, um, and that's what I lean on. Yeah. Yeah. That's so well articulated. And something that comes to my mind is, I think Alistair McIntosh has spoken about this, this tendency for colonial culture or civilization to kind of form a monoculture. There's this universalism, this commodification in a sense, what I was hearing about some of these invasive species is they're eliminating biodiversity and in a way, preserving or reintegrating biodiversity is an act of decolonization. I, I guess to close, I'd I'd like, I'd like to know what your, where your hope lies. What visions would you like to share with us so that we can water them Mm. as, as a collective hearing your words? Let me take a breath here for this one. <laughs> so what I'm feeling called to speak about now um, has to do with death. And um, in our, our fear around what that is and I have hope for death. I have a sense that this thing that we call living and dying is one and the same. You know, there's this cycle and there's this process and that really leaning into that um, is important as we are um, either going to be experiencing that a lot of human death and suffering in and around us, if that's something that's you're experiencing now, witnessing that, witnessing the death of species, witnessing the loss of ecosystems, and um, um, witnessing the completion of things. And I feel that orienting ourselves toward the mystery of what that is, instead of assuming that we know um, is a place that brings me a lot of hope. I'm not rushing. I'm not rushing to end it all myself, but, you know, I do seek to live my life in such a way that, you know, my, my bones might be a blessing for the ground that they fall upon, you know, Mm-hmm. that whoever gets to eat <laughs> what's left of me is nourished and continues. And so as we are required to face that and to witness that and for future generations to do that, um, there is um, there's a, a beauty and a grace in that and mourning the dead and remembering what we've seen Um whether it's, you know, butterflies and creatures that I have seen in my lifetime that are no longer, you know, 
being there with our eyes open and honoring the lives and honoring the dead and remembering them, remembering them. Um, That brings me a lot of hope because um, the work of the living cannot be done by the living alone. Like we, our own lives are accumulation of the offerings of the lives of so many others. And so if I can hold that within myself, like the, um, it's, it's hard, it's hard to lose sight of the gratitude, you know, and, Mm. you know, you can't force that, you know, okay, just be grateful, but I can lean into those, um, the memories of those who have lived and died, both my human ancestors and the plants that I've eaten and the food that I've eaten and the creatures that I've put in my body that very day, you know, and do right by them. So Mm. there is, there is an opportunity for all that has, that is departing, you know, from the world of the living to be a continued resource and renewal. And, you know, for any of us that work, with, you know, some of these big psychoactive substances, they're telling this, uh, this again and again, you know, they're, they're cycling, they're moving, they're endlessly creative. And I don't know what comes next, but um, I'm seeking in my lifetime to prepare for it. Um, So that's, that's where I, there's, that's what I would leave you and leave Mm. folks like, you know, instead of fearing the mystery of it to really honor the mystery of it and to have a sense of, of reverence for the unknown without seeking to know it. We'll get, we'll get our turn. We'll get our turn. Yeah. You know, it's coming. Yeah. So oh, beautifully put having reverence for the unknown. And I think the closer we, we get to, a deepened sense of reciprocity and relationship with the land the closer we get to a relationship with death because it is everywhere it's all around us and it's a big that's a big protest against our current cultural paradigm to start looking at it and honoring it Thank you for being here with the Rooted Healing community. Through deepened imagination, consciousness expansion and cross-cultural wisdom exchange, we explore psychedelic culture, spirituality and ecology to ignite collective healing. We offer nature immersive ceremonial gatherings, legal and safe psychedelic assisted psilocybin retreats, integrative healing courses and a growing collection of resources rooted in regenerative reciprocity. Visit rootedhealing.org to learn more please do consider joining our patron community where you can gift forward and support our work in exchange for bonus material, book and gift giveaways, meditations, workshops, episode transcripts, community discussion and array of resources from our guests and discounts to our events. Your monthly contribution, which can be as little as £2 a month, helps us cover the costs of running the show and our hope is to gather enough abundant gifters to afford professional audio productions so that we can free up more time to focus on gathering together in person, which is the heartbeat of our work. Come follow us on Instagram at Rooted Healing Co. or find us on the various platforms you tune into. And don't forget to rate, review and subscribe to the show if these stories and conversations are touching you. It's a beautiful act of reciprocity to make those couple of clicks and help others discover our work. The music in this episode was by Mike Howe, Chris Park and Dory Joy. Thank you so much for these contributions and if you'd like to contribute your music, please get in touch. I'm your host, Veronica Stanwell. Thanks for listening.